Hello and welcome to episode five of the LUXR podcast. With us today, we have Jamie. I'm your host, Skander. And we also have Dr. Andrea Brock, who's a lecturer in international relations at Sussex University and specializes in political ecology. Andrea, hi, how are you? Hello, I'm very good, thank you. How are you? Good, good. It's a, a rainy day in Belgium. Um, everyone's still in lockdown, but things are easing up. I don't know about the UK, but things are easing up here. So um, Today, we'd like to talk to you about a new few articles of yours on political ecology and more precisely about the sort of real cost of renewable energy, um, I guess, which is something we've talked about with Alexander Dunlap on episode four. Um, and I think I can speak for Jamie and myself when I say that we learned a lot. Um, it was a tremendous learning experience and episode. Um, yeah. And so we'd like to kind of continue that trend again with someone outside of Lancaster University um, from Sussex University this time. And uh, yeah, if we just kind of jump right into it, um, in January 2020, uh, you wrote, uh, or at least published, an article called The Decarbonization Divide, Contextualizing Landscapes of Low Carbon Exploitation and Toxicity in Africa. Um, so this, this study really uh, jumped out to me personally, because just, with, just like with Alexander, we really never see the extent, I think, of our effects um, in terms of environment and especially not in terms of renewable energy. We're like we learned last time, we're kind of taught to see renewable energy as this clean, magical solution, but in reality, it's not really. Um, is there anything that, you, that you'd like to start off sort of uh, with uh, this article with telling us about the decarbonization divide? Yeah, sure. So this is um, work that was led by um, Benjamin Sovakov from SPRU at Sussex um, and colleagues. And is really to point to yeah the, the dark side of the renewable energy transitions we're seeing, um, which is becoming a kind of bigger theme in our work to look at um, the outsourcing of the ecological costs of energy production as um, many governments are moving towards what is often called renewable or sustainable energy systems, which, um, as Zander probably outlined um, last week, we are quite critical of, um, particularly that divide between conventional and green or sustainable, because often those costs are very much existent, but they are not visible in countries of the global north. Um, I mean, we see maybe shiny um, solar panels or windmills, um, but we don't, or wind farms, but we don't really see the mining and the e-waste that is um, also part of, of those technologies. Um, and so this, this research was, um, as I said, based on, on research um, in Ghana and the Democratic Republic of, of the Congo and kind of really showed the very, um, the, the social and ecological costs of um, metals and minerals that are needed for um, so-called renewable energy. Mm. Yeah, in terms of um, just speaking about e-waste, uh, electronic waste, I, I really did not did not sort of foresee the the numbers that I would see in this study. Um, things like every year, uh, some forty five million metric tons of e-waste are generated, which is about four thousand five hundred Eiffel towers. The amount ra- rises by about eight million tons annually, and only twenty percent of it is recycled. I mean, these are ridiculous numbers, which um, I've, I don't know, I've personally never seen before and, and, and not, I, I feel like maybe I've seen it in some sort of uh, climate change reports and such, but definitely not been highlighted, I, I personally feel. And, uh, and these ideas that these trends are actually going up as well, um, especially for things like battery technologies for electric vehicles and things like solar panels. You, you say in the, in the article that, um, solar PV, so uh, photovoltaic waste flow, could even be bigger in 2050 than all the e-waste flow in 2018. Mm-hmm. That's, um, that's quite ridiculous. And, and this, I mean, it's, it's an insane amount of, of waste, which, you know, I, I guess you, you talk about, this is kind of the subject of your article, requires uh, tremendous kind of resources from the first end of the spectrum. And also then requires a lot of space and a lot of uh, dangerous practices that to then get rid of the of the waste. Um, can you tell us a little bit about 
uh, maybe your your two case studies. So that was the Democratic Republic of Congo and uh, a small a part of the capital, I think it was right, in Ghana. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I did not do the field work, so I'm probably not the best mm. person to actually speak about the field work experience. That's Benjamin Silvercall. Um, but of course, these um, were, were chosen because they were so they are so involved in the kind of international supply chain of um, these technologies, um, both at the the back end and and the very beginning, so to say. And I think both of these points are invisibilized um, very much in kind of climate change discussions in in the global north because they tend to be, you know, outside of our sights. So when we look at um, coal mining or lignite mining in Europe, we see these enormous moon landscapes in front of us and we realize this is not sustainable. We are literally opening up the earth and um, you know, creating so much destruction for uh, energy um, production. But with um, many renewable energy technologies, that's not the case. We, we don't see the mining operations that are usually in the global south. and We don't see where the e-waste ends up so what it does, I think, is challenge um, challenge debates around climate change that rely on technological solutions um, for climate crisis. Would you would you call it an export of of these issues? Absolutely, it's an outsourcing of the ecological costs. Yeah, which is enhancing climate injustice, um, environmental racism, etc. All right. And uh, I mean, for the, I guess you said that you didn't do the uh, field research, but um, it struck me that um, that so much sort of mineral and, and metals are, are required for, for something like, um, like wind turbines. Um, the research says that Europe needs to install about 100,000 new wind turbines by 2050. And that, that would mean 730,000 uh, thousand tons of e-waste additionally mm -hmm. um and then and obviously you know as we're saying it, it's exporting i mean the the study says that congo um is one of the leading exporters of cobalt um and you know it's not let's not be let's not kid ourselves here mining cobalt is not safe right mm -hmm. It's um, could you maybe I don't know if you worked on on this exact bit, but could you maybe talk to us about the dangers of of mining cobalt and of of the toxic e waste as well in terms of the environment and the people? Yeah, I mean it's um, as you already said, mining is it can, lots of types of lots of mining. Um, now let me start again. Mining can never be sustainable. Now mining can never be. Um, green mining can never be something we should, we should rely on uh, in the long term because it will always rely on extracting resources from the um, earth at huge social and ecological cost. So um, you have um, the toxicity that um, is mentioned in the paper, you have the, um, the pollution of water, of soil, of land, um, you have um, the unequal um, gendered impact of mining, the marginalization of of women and of migrant workers, the, the hierarchies that, are, that the mining operation um, is based on and exacerbates. Um, we talk about um, the child labor and exploitation of, of, of very small children in these mines. Yeah, which is, which is potentially the part that for me at least struck me the most. I mean, I, I think we're all, we're all, um, we're all quite uh, harshly kind of affected by the the fate and, and plight of children i think in general and like that really strikes a chord and i think the the numbers and and not just the numbers the interviews as well the sort of qualitative uh, assessments mm -hmm. were, were really horrendous i mean children forced to to kind of work because it, it pays so much uh were forced in a sense to work 10 to 14 hours a day um yeah. a lot at night and like often under the dangers of things like um, security guards potentially like drowning them beatings whipping mm -hmm. psychological physical sexual abuse underwater underground all these sort of things i mean that's horrible it's it's nothing short of horrible i just i just have a a question um so so these horrible negative effects of the the mining industry would would you say they are 
um, very common and widespread. And furthermore, would you would you say the, that many uh, northern global states uh, are you know benefiting or relying directly on uh, these industries and their you know the the malpractices they're they're doing? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's lots of work that shows the horrible um, conditions under which mining takes place across the world. Um, um, even like things like child labor, <coughs> child labor, sexual abuse, all of these are they, they're not unique to our case, right? Like that's kind of like lots of mining operations um, kind of involve involve these practices. So um, mining has historically been a, a really dangerous and exploitative and ecologically damaging activities and let's not kid ourselves i mean that we are profiting from that right as people in belgium and um people in the uk who can um get cheap um cheap laptops cheap electric devices cheap cheap everything um so yes of course the global north is very much profiting off this um and global government states corporations are, of course are very much aware of that right but it's um the profit um motive of, of capitalism that drives these processes right like, i mean um and that's why you, you mentioned before and just the, the dimensions of um the, the increases in um required certain minerals and me, uh, me, minerals and metals that we require um you know as production increases as um certain uh, in certain countries um living standards raise and as we're continuing over consuming in the global north because um that's that's what that growth relies on, right? So obviously that growth is unsustainable. Um, that's why we need a controlled degrowth rather than um, green growth or green capitalism, which are all the green mythologies that are put forward in order not to challenge the status quo, in order to be able to continue this, right? In order to continue, the, in order to be able to continue these exploitative relationships um, and ec ecological injustices. Um, mm -hmm. And there's governments and states that are, you know, responsible for this, um, and as well as transnational corporations. It's not the individual consumer that can, um, you know, influence these through kind of consumer choices. It's about um, a system, a status capitalist system that relies on exploitation, social and ecological degradation, um, which we need to break. Yeah, I, uh, I'd just like to read one of the statements from the from the paper, which was, um, I think, from an interview with, um, well, his name is just CCR4, because I guess you have to protect the identities of the of the mm -hmm. miners and stuff. But um, CCR4, a digger who stated that he was 14, but looked less than 10 years old, said that he works 10 to 14 hours a day when there's daylight so that I can send money to my sisters and my mother. Sometimes at night, I will sneak into the concession to look for copper, cobalt, and malachite though I need to watch out for the dogs and the guards. I make about 50 cents of a US dollar a day. Um, and that's followed by an astounding statistic, actually, that I had to read twice to, to, to really grasp, which was that in the 150 mining communities of Katanga in Congo, about 23% of children worked in the mines. Now, I had first read that as about 23% of the workers were children, but this is even worse than that. Twenty-three, one in four children almost uh, works in mines. Um, I, I, and that that really got me to think. You know, if if it's such an obvious issue, or at least an obvious um, uh, thing that's happening in Congo, what is like? How do we not know about it? Or if we know about it, then why are we so complacent? Because that's kind of what your article attacks in the sense of the complacency of. Of, uh, of institutions and people in general towards this? Why are we so complacent? Um, like, uh, I think for <laughs> corporations and states, this is, this is not news in that sense. Um, I think it's new, um, oh, it's uncomfortable for mm -hmm. e ecological and climate movements who just have a way to positive image of renewable energy and um, electricity production, right? That's what, that's where it's kind of intervening in one way. But also, of course, yes, um, 
getting corporations and states to realize that um, just shifting to uh, to more of this is not the solution. I mean, personally, this, this is just me. This is not. I'm not speaking for the other mm -hmm. authors in um, of that study. Personally, for me, appealing to governments and corporations with these um, figures, shocking figures and interviews, um, isn't very promising because capitalism doesn't care. Yeah. States don't care. You know, individuals employed in them might, but, you know, these institutions as such, they are based on, they're grounded in the exploitation and um, destruction of nature and of, of human communities. Mm -hmm. Right. It's up to us as um, as people to say no to this. And again, not by consumer choices, through consumer choices, but by collective organizing. Like, the history of mining has always been a history of resistance across the world. Indigenous communities, you, often women-led um, communities, have resisted mining since um, you know for, for centuries. Right. Mm -hmm. It's always been a very kind of contested activity and often very successfully contested right yeah. and we can all do that i mean like there are minds all around us including in in western europe and in the uk that we should be resisting right even yeah. even if you don't have the same kind of inhumane working conditions um here like these things exist here like the, the, the like mining is exists here of course right and we need to break the, the power of these corporations that have these transnational supply chains um, that allow them to um, to outsource and invisibilize the, these ecological and social costs into the global south. So it's about breaking corporate power. It's about um, breaking state power. It's about collective action and collective organizing in order to do that and, find, and to find alternatives that operate outside of capitalist um, principles of um, you know, competition and growth based on uh, principles of solidarity, mutual aid, community organizing, degrowth, et cetera. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, one of the things, so to, then we can kind of move on maybe to the uh, the love for sale article. Um, one of the things that stood out to me in the, in the bit on Ghana, um, so this was a community in Accra, um, in Ghana, and one of the things that stood out to me when I was reading it, you know, because I... <laughs> funnily enough uh, my phone broke uh like last week and my the charging area i don't know if you can see this basically charging bit right broke and i wasn't able to charge my phone anymore so it was just a dead phone i tried to repair it people told me I, it wasn't repairable um and i just had to get a new phone so today my new phone just arrived but i'm left kind of thinking well what do i do with my old phone like I don't want it to end up in in Ghana for you know for these children to 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 get um you know terrible sort of to to start burning and to get terrible um, diseases from and and, and terrible working conditions and such. So I like reading this was very poignant for me because I I really felt like you know I'm directly contributing to this like just even today just with this phone i still haven't thrown it away because i don't know what to do with it um so it's it's yeah i think we can all relate to to this and i don't even know if there is currently enough really ways for us to to dispose for example of a phone well or to repair a phone properly um and i think these questions are really kind of good points to start at right yeah but they i think they also raise kind of wider issues around um you know, your phone broke, fair enough. But, you know, mm -hmm. the, the kind of trend of getting a phone, new phone every two years and um, yeah, sure. kind of, you know, the, the power of the advertising industry and overconsumption and kind of how we are all part of that system and our mindset has been, you know, shaped mm -hmm. by this system as well. So it's also about kind of, yeah, realizing this. And things like, uh, what is it called? Programmed... Um... Programmed obsolescence is definitely a problem as well, I think, um, because, you know, we, you realize like after having a phone for a few years, I mean, this one broke, but at the same time, I realized, well, it's slowing down. I can't, sometimes I can't even open my apps anymore without having to wait a few, you know, a few minutes, sometimes 10 minutes, it's, it crashes randomly. Um, so maybe the, 
there's some sort of regulations to be had as well around uh, planned obsolescence, but also things like um, trends and, and how how durable phones are, but also maybe, I don't know, it's difficult to, to, to think of how we could push people to or nudge people to yeah. not buy a phone every two years. Because again, yeah, it seems like a cultural thing um, as well, largely. So what really interested me about the Selling Love article was, and uh, as we talked about a bit briefly, is how these, how um, agents in these industries present themselves as green and sustainable. So you discuss um, the Malaysian biobanks, biodiversity uh, conservation certificates, and they're presenting them as like, okay, this is a solution. You know, you can, it, you, you, we are giving you a tangible way to invest in uh, your environment. How is this sort of deceptive and how does this not really solve the problem, would you say? Right, yeah, I think to answer that, maybe I should just briefly go back to the very idea of biodiversity offsetting yep, yep. that this is based on, right? And that is the idea that um, it's fine to destroy nature somewhere because you can offset it by compensating through either restoring nature or creating new nature or conserving existing nature, existing nature elsewhere, right? So, and this is quite similar to the idea of, of carbon offsetting that people may have heard of. But this is the idea that, uh, of, of compensation of biodiversity loss, which is of course incredibly problem problematic because nature is unique and nature isn't the same, like, you know, 50 kilometers away and ecosystems are interconnected. And it's really problematic for lots and lots of reasons um, in that, um, it doesn't work in an ecological sense more often than not. It does work, however, in a kind of more political sense, in like giving the illusion of um, yeah. things are being done, right? We're taking action to conserve nature. We're taking action to kind of green mining or whatever else. Um, yeah, and so um, in the history of offsetting is very closely related to the history of um, extractive industries. Um, mining, and then of course, in in this case, is um, a biobank. The article is about a biobank in Malaysia, where it's meant to offset or was meant to compensate for the loss of uh, orangutan habitat, among other mm, uh, ecosystems. How 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 is this uh, initiative? How how is how are the biodiversity conservation certificates sort of deceptive in that they don't really solve the problem, but they're presented in a way presented that they do. Yeah, they, they're a bit similar to kind of, you know, buying your way out of um, having a bad conscience after flying. Yeah. Right? Like getting one of these little certificates that make you feel good, make you feel like you've compensated for flying, whereas really they don't actually undo the emissions that were emitted, mm -hmm. right? They didn't undo the damage. In fact, they, um, they facilitate this destruction because um, they... Um, how should I call it? They they flexibilize the limits of nature destruction, right? So there isn't any more this kind of limit that uh, a company, for instance, can't cross. Hmm. Uh, these limits are becoming increasingly meaningless 
as they're flexible because um, they can be offset through um, investment into nature conservation elsewhere, for instance. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, they're facilitating destruction rather than rather than limiting it. So for for the listeners, uh, Zoe, could you maybe contextualize just the the case study of the that that example? In in was it Malaysia? Mm. Right. Yeah, it was Malaysia. Um, this is work from 2015 when um, um, well, logging companies, palm oil corporations, um, and even individual citizens were um, encouraged to compensate for their biodiversity impact by buying these um, biodiversity offsets, which were called biodiversity conservation certificates in the Malua Biobank. And um, is part of um, kind of a wider trend of, um, kind of what is often called market-based conservation and market-based solution to ecological um, destruction, where, which is all about basically yeah, in, ex internalizing the externalities like biodiversity loss and mm -hmm. emissions um, in order to, um, to make people pay the real or the true price of um, a product or an activity, whatever else. Um, more recently, I've also kind of worked on a biodiversity offsetting in relation to um, the German Rhineland. So um, particularly okay. the, um, the Hambach mine, which is the world's largest open cast lignite coal mine. Um, absolutely mm -hmm. enormous, the world, largest human made hole in the world. Um, well, which can, you, can you give us, us, sorry, do you mind just giving us maybe like, because uh, we haven't really seen any pictures of it even. Do you mind give us an idea of like how big it is? Do you know sort of, you know, how many football fields or how many, you know? Um, yes, I can. I think it's 80, 82 square kilometers. Oh, that wow. <laughs> that is, yeah, okay, that's big. Bigger than Brighton and Hove, I believe, or, the, or similar size to Brighton and Hove. Yeah, I think it's something like 82 square kilometers. Um, if, you Google, if you look on Google Maps, you can actually see it. Yeah, um, oh on Google Maps, it's just this absolutely enormous moon landscape, um, which has led to the displacement of, of thousands of people over the last decades, um, in addition to um, the destruction of one of the oldest forests of Europe, the ancient Hambacher Forest. And in order to compensate for the loss of this ancient forest, um, to follow environmental uh, regulations, um, the mine operator, RWEs, had to um, to create um, something I call a biodiversity offset, um, which is kind of based on the same idea, you know, like creating mm. a new nature to yeah. offset for the destruction of this 12,000 year old forest, which obviously doesn't quite work. Yeah, this is you know, historical, they, 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 sentimental yeah. forest, yeah. Yeah, it's something, there is a new forest there, but it's not comparable to the ancient Hambacher forest and um, the, the, the ancient trees in it and lots of the species that have gotten lost but it helps legitimize and greenwash these incredibly destructive yeah. activities right and distract from the fact that the um, Hambach coal mine is also um, um, a CO2 catastrophe the three um, German mines the RW that RW the mine operator uh, operates in the German Rhineland are the largest source of CO2 emissions in all of Europe Right? Oh, wow. So it's a, it's a way of greenwashing um, an ecological catastrophe, right? Yeah. And, um, and drawing in local um, nature lovers and conservationists and um, nature um, organizations into, into that process. So it's also about co-opting the sand. It's about um, getting people to stop criticizing um, the mining yeah. operations and instead um, praise the kind of new ecotouristic opportunities that were provided. You know, they invest a lot in kind of new bike paths and footpaths and creating yeah. a new infrastructure to turn both the mine but also the offset site into um, what we call extractive attractions, right? Getting people to um, to wander around, to, to come there with their dogs on the weekends, to, to enjoy yeah. the new nature Oof. and to um, and to look at the mine as an, an as an attraction. Like to it's quite look somber. At the huge in, in machinery a way. and yeah. I, 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 su I suppose that you know these 
this um, asso associating yourself and presenting yourself as green sustainable is, uh, you know, very successful to a degree. A lot of people will just accept that narrative. Um, but the, you know, pe pe people kind of are aware of what's really happening, and especially those who are displaced, uh, you know, in Germany and Malaysia, um, they they won't accept this narrative and they offer um, resistance, I suppose. But they uh, these agents in these industries kind of um, account for that as well, uh, don't they? They they they, I guess have deceptive discourses towards these organized resistances as well. Um, maybe you could talk a bit about that. Yes, yes. I mean, managing environmental impact is just as much about managing local opposition as, about, as it is about the actual impact, if that makes sense, right? So a, a large part of mining companies uh, work is about you know co-opting and oppressing resistance because that's what threatens their operation right so both in in Malaysia um, where of course palm oil um, um, old palm agriculture is very much resisted as well as in the German Rhineland where um, coal mining is very much re resisted um, including by a, a long-standing forest occupation lots of community groups um, yearly mass actions etc um, that's one of the main um, yeah, areas of work. And that is why um, mining companies in particular invest so much money into corporate social responsibility initiatives, um, PR work, sponsorships, um, education, you know, they, they lobby local politicians, they lobby national politicians, they go into schools and give out free um, um, Tupperwares to first graders, you know, they, they finance sport yeah. clubs, they do everything they can to present themselves as good corporate citizens um, in order to, um, to gain and maintain um, a license to operate and the kind of positive image in the face of, of opposition. Yeah. Do you think that these people know that, that they have such an impact? Like the, the people especially that work to co-op the the uh, opponents of such practices do you think that they know that what they're doing is kind of trying to greenwash a, a terrible uh, ecological catastrophe do you mean the people working for the corporations yeah. i don't know if you've had any run-ins with them <laughs> i mean i've i've interviewed lots of people who work for um for mining companies mm -hmm. uh with very mixed results um you know people have families to feed and yeah. um rent to pay and mortgages to pay and um many don't really um don't really um reflect too much no that's that's mm -hmm. the wrong word um you know, it's it's hard to blame them and as individu as individuals, yeah. right? They are also kind of partly exploited by the corporations they work for. Um, is everyone's kind of decision at the end of the day whether that's yeah. something they can um, they can live with? But I don't really want to blame I don't really want to blame the workers um, who who work for these companies. Or, but really, kind of is is. Is the bosses, is the people um, who are actually profiting from this, who make millions of this, um, including mm -hmm. politicians, right, who make millions um, profiting from a very lucrative um, kind of side jobs in these corporations, um, particularly in the German Rhineland, um, and who, who, who kind of keep that going. Yeah. So um, we've looked at like particular strategies. Um, these corporations employ to kind of get enough consent from the locals or the general population. There's also the side, um, a, a large part of their strategy is associating themselves with these um, positive green movements and with particular international bodies. So that that's another side of convincing they have to do. Um, so it, could you talk a bit about that, please? Yeah, that's why corporations love doing conservation partnerships with environmental organizations, for instance. 
That's why they love partnering up with with anyone who's got some kind of green credentials um, in order to um, in order to showcase just how sustainable and green they are and just how seriously they take ecological crises, biodiversity loss, you know, social costs, ecological costs of their operations. And how, how do they um, partner up with them? Is it kind of a similar process of like endorsement and funding perhaps? Um, yeah, these partnerships are quite diverse, but um, they, they usually involve um, an, an environmental organization um, that is uh, contributing environmental expertise as well as good, good reputation and hoping that in the process of partnering up with the corporation, there will be some kind of effect on um, mm. their the business practices um, in the sense that, you know, something becomes right. more sustainable or um, um, they change their business practices yeah. or the environmental impacts are reduced. Um, and then the comp the corporation, obviously, they are the ones bringing the um, bringing the money, bringing the, um, the yeah the, the money into the equation, basically. Right. Yeah. I was wondering, what what would you want everyone to know? Maybe if we kind of regroup the the mine in Congo, the e waste facilities in Ghana, and um, this destruction of forests in the mine in, in Germany. What what's like the one thing that you'd want people to really know if if you kind of, you know if you could have all the airwaves to yourself right now and you'd have one message to for people who are through through your research what would it be? Mining can never be sustainable. There's no such thing as green mining. We cannot rely on technological change to tackle ecocide and climate catastrophe. We need social and political change. We need to break corporate power. We need to work towards a system that is that is not reliant on growth, that is not reliant on or based on a system of states and um, private corporations. If we take this kind of we're positive first, I feel like we've, we've been talking a lot about sort of the negative aspects of things. Um, we always try and, and look, Jamie and I, and, and I guess other co-hosts have been on here as well. We always try and look at the solutions as well, right? Like what can be done about this? Because obviously this is a horrendous issue. The mining seems to have um, impacts on the environment, on people. It seems to exacerbate um, effects that, that are already there. Uh, waste as well. And and uh, these kind of fake sort of greenwashing greenwashing efforts seem to just worsen everything as well so what can we do to to kind of go against this current and and improve things while not destroying the planet in our quest to improve things right as we're doing with renewables yeah, i guess it's really hard because it's not just about economic regulation like you know even if you got the, the the eu to be fully on board with regulating these things you still need to get people to consume less i suppose mm. i mean i think it's it's about collective organizing to shut down these destructive industries and to imagine and live alternatives so it's something that anarchists um, sometimes called um, configurative politics or configuration like live the change you want to see right kind of um, imagine and live alternative relations and alternative um kind of lives that are not based on the principles that drive the global political economy, like growth and competition, mm -hmm. right? So um, I think those are you know, the, the, the two key, key work, uh, uh, ways. Um, those include like building and, and supporting local cooperatives, alternative and support, uh, sorry, um, imagine and live and, um, and build up alternative farming um, systems, um, listen to learn from um indigenous organizers who've been like fighting back against this stuff for for centuries and have so much more of a deeper understanding and knowledge of the relationship between um the destruction that comes with these industrial processes colonialism statism and corporate power we often don't really kind of recognize that enough i would say 
Do you, do you think these voices of displaced people and uh, indigenous peoples who've had their environment uh, ruined, do you, do you think that, well, they're probably not, uh, you know, getting enough of a voice in these institutions such as the EU could, that could actually make change? And perhaps how, how could we increase, uh, you know, the, the amount of people who hear their voices or, I don't know. I mean, we can, we can bring their voices into discussions here. So one of the projects I'm involved in is, is an initiative, a network called um, Decolonize Europe, which is all about centering the voices of the people who are most affected by um, um, the imported European coal. And they are mainly um, indigenous um, and other local communities in Colombia and um, um, in Russia. Mm. Right. So centering their voices in European climate discourses, climate movements is, is a start, for instance, right? Re realizing um, the neocolonial and colonial relationships that our energy system is based on and continues to be based on, um, recognizing how we're profiting from it at the cost of um, racialized people, indigenous people across the world. Um, I think those are all ways of bringing them into discussions and um, in debates mm. here. And to potentially see the, the real impacts of offsetting as well. Um, I was, mm. I've always been wondering, you know, what happens when, for example, if I take a flight and I, I pay that extra, like, you know, Ryanair or something, let's you pay an extra, was it like one euro, something to offset your, your carbon emissions for the flight? Um, I always found that really weird because I, I, I could never find out like where that money goes and, and what it actually actually does, whether it goes to a monoculture of trees, you know, in a random yeah. place in Europe and Africa and Asia where, you know, um, so I feel like offsetting and, and, and a lot of like defenders of offsetting it, like people that I've spoken to who, who are really in favor of offsetting and see it as a sort of big solution. I think the, the thing that I've noticed is an, over focus on on the idea of trees for example being um carbon capture kind of um uh, entities they almost it's almost like they see trees as carbon capture uh, technology mm. or something <laughs> it's like uh, they see trees as technology in a sense that we can we can put everywhere to just capture the carbon and then everything will be fine but i feel like we've divided the climate crisis into oh it's just emissions of co2 and not all the human aspects and all the pollutants and all the sort of extractive uh, processes as well that, that have so many impacts on the flora, on the fauna, you know, and all these sort of impacts. Um, and I guess my, my question here is, is really, is there a way to offset properly? Like, is there a way to offset without kind of feeling bad? Or do you think all offsetting should kind of be off the table because it, it like you said before, it, it blurs the the limits as well yeah no i think there is absolutely no right way of offsetting i right. mean offsetting is often defended as better than nothing mm -hmm. but i would say is actually worse than nothing in a lot of ways because it gives perverse incentives it allows for destructive development that wouldn't otherwise have happened it allows for um people to feel good about um you know things like flying um which um which just the impacts of which just cannot be offset. You talk about the um, the focus on CO2, and I think that's a huge problem in that um, this kind of carbon reductionism um, obviously leaves out all of the other ecological crises we're currently witnessing, the six mass extinctions, mm -hmm. the um, degradation and, um, and loss of fertile soils and um, the loss of non-human species. Um, that are kind of invisibilized by only focusing on carbon. And while obviously, um, yeah, carbon emissions are important, um, the reduction of carbon emissions alone isn't isn't going to cut it. What we need is is fundamental political and social change that is, um, you know, works towards a kind of different relationship with nature between humans and nature, with humans yeah. being part of nature and ecological systems. Um, and that requires us to challenge and undo all of the 
the hierarchies that I've already raised. So um, the state state hierarchies, corporate power, but also um, you know white supremacy, pa patriarchy, colonial relationships that are so closely tied to extractivism, etc. Um, these are all necessary to challenge and to overcome the, the reductionist focus on, on, on carbon and look at this in a much more holistic way. Yeah, I was thinking in the, in the light of, of the Black Lives Matter uh, things happening around the world, you know, it, it got me like the sort of racial aspect of politics got me really thinking about uh, whether we would be more aware of things if uh, if it was happening in our own backyard like in in europe you know if if it were let's say like you know let's say i don't know germans or belgians that had to mine cobalt and then let's say like slovenians and and lithuanians had to to care for the e-waste you know i i i kind of got me thinking like yeah maybe we wouldn't really allow that to happen um mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, look at the resistance. Divine. Look at the resistance against fracking, right? Because when you yeah. see it and when you feel it and when you're actually worried about your water quality, etc., that kind of drives it home mm -hmm. in a very different way, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when we when we fight against ecocide, it's also about it's always about um, environmental justice against environmental racism you know in against kind of these mm -hmm. neo-colonial relationships and colonial relationships that characterize um well, our current world order but also kind of energy provision etc mm -hmm. are there um, i don't know if you're aware of any of the like if you're doing kind of research right now on, or even in your personal time um on what the european union for example is doing um, well, I guess this doesn't include you, Jamie, anymore, since <laughs> since Brexit is uh, definitely still no, happening. No. <laughs> but um, I I had a little bit of a look at um, at von der Leyen's um, what 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 does she call it the the green green deal or something like that? Like I don't know um, some sort of plan for environmental improvements around Europe. And it feels very, very like it feels like a cop out. Like you know, it feels it feels like it's full of those things that we talked about about offsetting, about greenwashing, um, and the carbon like carbon e ecosystem division. I was wondering if, if uh, if you knew kind of whether this the research that, for example, you do does it does it get seen by those people like especially in politics? Like, do you get asked maybe, or do they? Do they kind of reach out or or do you think they kind of just completely ignore it? I'm wondering, basically, my question is, is this ignorance or is this kind of chosen apathy in a sense? I mean, EU officials also, for instance, operate within the structures of capitalism and statism. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter what individual, for me, at least, yeah. what, you know, individual thing. And yeah, of course, some of them have read my, my work. But they, you know, we in a system that is based on these premises of growth. Like, if if that's not challenged, then everything else is just going to be greenwashing. Yeah, right. Okay, so it's all about system change, not sort of individual. Yeah. So, yeah. like, if the Absolutely. EU as an institution broadly tolerates or, in some cases, supports this kind of industry, then an individual won't have much power. Um, in the, even an official yeah and particularly if they've got you know the army of lobbyists um telling them uh, what to do you know so i mean think about mm. the, the lobbying power of energy corporations of the automobile industry all of the kind of big destructive industries in europe i mean almost every every industry i feel could be listed in that that's the that's the both amazing and terrible thing that you realize i think when you start you know, researching and reading into environmental studies is realize that it impacts everything. Like everything impacts nature and nature impacts everything. It's just, it's a, a holistic relationship really at its core. Um, so everything from food, even for example, like our whole food industry seems absolutely catastrophic when you take a deeper look at it. Um, yeah. And yeah. And everything that we have nowadays, like so much of it is electronic and we try and make everything electronic 
but yeah like you said you know you you, you said it before the invisibilization of of these practices at both ends of uh, the divide kind of kind of serve to to protect us i think in a sense from mm -hmm. the the harsh realizations and that that is why like the, the response like um the response tends to be based on schemes like biodiversity offsetting, which um, kind of speak to the logic of the system, right? They're based on the further um, commodification, financialization, um, abstraction of nature, right? The packaging into kind of habitat of this species or that species, um, mm -hmm. rather than actually challenge it challenging the industrial activities that are responsible for this destruction right and if at all then you know maybe they get outsourced to um to other parts of the world right if we see a decline yeah. in the of the steel industry for instance in the uk um but that doesn't mean any less steel is being produced it's just being outsourced to um um asia for instance right um, we just just mentioned that because it's so closely tied to the coal industry. Um, you need coal for steel production, uh, and interestingly, yeah. you need steel for wind power, right? So there we are yeah. again. Something that we learned uh, with uh, Alex, actually Alexander, last time was uh, yeah. was that realization, <laughs> which neither of us I think had heard before. <laughs> I just have like kind of a final general broad question. Ask, ask something similar to uh, Alex last time, but. Um, do you think that since the people actually being affected are organizing themselves, but f sort of failing to offer a proper resistance to kind of stop the, stop this industry occurring, do you think globally there's kind of an imbalance of political power in, in a, in a citizen sense? Do you think if people organized that became aware of and, you know, really cared about and organized themselves um, in, you know, the, the West or the global North where a, a I suppose a, a lot of these large corporations are roughly based and ha have a lot of influence. Do you think perhaps that would be more important? Do you, do you think citizens in the quote unquote, glo you know, global North or the West or um, kind of have more responsibility or have the power to stop this mm. just com comparatively to, to those actually being affected by it? Uh, the problem, if I can just quickly raise something while you 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 think, um, Andrea, is that um, just very quickly on a side note, the the study, the um, decarbonization divide was saying that um, actually in those countries, for example, where things are mined and such, people don't really fight against it too much. It seems, at least from what I understood, they kind of they know they know full well like the impacts of it, but you know, when it's like the only way, when it's seen by a lot of people is the only way to get money, um, you accept a slow death rather than a death, right? Um, mm. That's kind of something as well. So it's not um, even like there is that much fighting, it looks like. I think there is a lot of fighting. Yeah. Um, yes, and I think, as I said earlier, we have so much to learn from um, indigenous organizers and communities who've, who've resisted um, extractive operations across the world for so long and continue to push back, right? Look at um, um, indigenous communities in North America at the moment, in Canada and um, in Latin America all across. So um, I think we have a responsibility in the global north in that because we've been profiting from this for so long, yeah, of course, we have a responsibility to to organize and to to, to take action. But um, really, we have, um, yeah, we have so much to learn from from these communities. Mm -hmm. And um, the other the other thing is, um, I mean, you know, why are people um, in in Ghana or um, or elsewhere kind of not resisting more actively is basically kind of what, what you're asking. Like, I mean, like we, we need to look at these global trade relations and these global systems in the context of colonialism, of course, right? Like, I mean, um, in the context of existing inequalities, um, 
someone once said um, the only thing that is worse um, than being exploited under capitalism is not to be exploited under capitalism. So in a way, um, yeah. yeah, of course, and you have nothing, no, no other choices because your local local economies, your local communities have been um, destroyed by um, centuries of colonialism and then neoliberal restructuring, etc. Then you're going to go along with um, you know, given the opportunity to, to earn a few bucks, obviously, but um, but that's the problem, right? The problem is how these how renewable energy operations, for instance, or, or extractive operations, are reinforcing and continuing these exploitative colonial relationships, right? So yeah. we need to go back and understand the history of of these places as well. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah completely um yeah no thank you that i think that that really sums it up quite well yeah um to kind of better understand the past i guess all right well dr andrea brock thank you so much for coming on the thank on the you show. it was really interesting yeah thank you and uh, we look forward to seeing your work further on at some point and yeah come back anytime <laughs> okay thanks